All right. So we've done significance tests already. Uh, we've only done them when we're running a significance test for a proportion. And so this is what you would use when you're trying to discern between two com competing claims. The competing claims are the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is what we assume to be true going in. And the alternative is what we're looking for evidence of, right? All right, so again, when we're carrying out a, a, a significance test for mu, um, we're checking our same three conditions, random, the data have to come from a random sample uh, from the population of interest, 10%. When sampling without replacement, your sample has to be less than 10% of the population size. And then large counts, um, either you know the population has the normal distribution or you know the sample size is greater than or equal to 30. But when we're talking about a mean, if neither of those is true, you can sketch a graph of the sample data and just make a statement that you don't see any strong skewness or outliers and it's safe to proceed with what we call T procedures because we're gonna be running a T test. And so just a reminder, it's not enough just to graph the data in your calculator. If you have to graph the data, you have to sketch that and label that graph and then make some statement about um, how there's not strong skew or outliers to receive full credit. All right, so let's just practice this real quick. We're given the lifetime and hours of 15 deluxe AAA batteries uh, from the company's simple random sample. Check if the conditions for performing the significance test are met. And so condition one, random. Well, again, they stated that it's a simple random sample, so that's met. All right, so 10%, we have a sample of 15 batteries, so I'll just say it's safe to assume. There are more than 10 times that, or 150 batteries. Um, the large counts condition, they don't tell us about the parents, the shape of the parent population of battery life. And our sample size equals 15, which is definitely less than 30. So let's just go ahead and remind you what's going to be expected is to graph that. And we'll go ahead and input that data into our calculator in list one. So. Freeze that while I enter my data. You guys take a second and enter yours. What do we got? So I have my data entered. All right, I'm going to go to stat plots. 
I actually have a couple of plots on from last time, so I'm going to choose the plots off option and then I'm going to go back in. Plot one, I do want my box plot turned on. Choose the one that has outliers so it'll show you if there are outliers. My X list is list one, frequency is one. And then we'll just do a zoom ninth option, zoom stat. There we go. So I bet it's because, go back into stat plot, choose the fourth option, hit enter, and then go back in and just turn the first one on. I bet you're, you had the, because we did an example with parallel box plots last week. Okay. And then, all right, so what we're going to do is just sketch this. Just like that, and then we'll give it an x-axis that we label, and then we'll make our statement, so. And the way we'll give ourselves a sense of scale is if you just hit trace on this graph, it'll let you jump between the five number summary. And that's, that's plenty of scale to put on your X axis. So 17, 27, 33, 44, and 51. All right, so here's what mine looks like. So again, I just labeled across the five number summary. Make sure that you label what the scale is. This is battery life in hours. And then we'll just say, the sample shows no strong skew or outliers and we'll proceed with T procedures. Um, and that just means it's safe to run a T test or create a confidence, a T confidence interval. So everything so far, the conditions are all the exact same as uh, the conditions for creating a confidence interval, which is what we did in the last class for a mean. Questions so far? All right, so the way we find a standardized test statistic, this is basically just a z-score. But it's only a z-score because it's you take your statistic, you subtract your population mean, which when we're running a significance test, your assumed population mean is the whatever the null hypothesis is. Okay, so it's mu naught. So I take x bar, I subtract mu naught, and then I divide by the standard deviation of the statistic. The problem with that, again, is that if you don't know the population mean, there's no way that you you know the population standard deviation, right? So what we end up doing is replacing that with the sample standard deviation, SX. But then we need to use a T distribution instead of a Z distribution. So there we go. Our T value is X bar minus mu naught divided by sample standard deviation or divided by the square root of n. And this whole thing we call standard error instead of standard deviation. Okay. 
Well, remember a T distribution is a lot like the Z distribution. The Z distribution is the standard normal distribution that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. A T distribution is a lot like that, but it has wider tails and it's generally skinnier and taller and it depends on the, the sample size. So when we perform inference using a t-distribution, the appropriate degrees of freedom, remember our sample size minus one. All right, and this is all stuff we've covered in creating confidence intervals. All right. Let's do another example. All right, suppose you want to perform a test of H null equals, uh, a, sorry, H naught is mu equals five versus H alternative is mu is not equal to five at the alpha equals 0.01 significance level. A random sample of size N equals 37 from the population of interest yields X bar equals 4.81 and SX equals 0.365. All right, so here they tell us, assume the conditions are met. We don't have to check conditions there. Explain why the result gives some evidence for the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so what I want you guys to do, take a look at our hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that mu equals 5. The alternative is that mu does not equal 5. Why does our sample result give some evidence for the alternative? What does our sample mean? And what's our alternative? Okay, so pretty concise answer. Why, why does our sample give some evidence for our alternative? Yeah, since X bar does not equal five, we have some evidence. That the true mean, which is mu, is not equal to five, right? All right, well, there are two competing reasons that X bar is not equal to five. It could be that the true population mean is actually equal to five, and we just got X bar not equal to five by random chance, right? That could be the case. Or it could be that the mean is not equal to five and we got X bar not equal to five because the mean is not equal to five. So we run the test to figure that out, right? And we wanna go So just a reminder, this is kind of going way back. If we think about, if we take all possible samples of X bar from this population and we go, I'm gonna assume that the true mean is five, then all these samples should center around five. Sure, sometimes we'll get above five, sometimes we'll get below five, right? But on average, they should be centered around the true value. Now we go in, we take a single sample, we get one of these X bars. We don't know which one, right? Could be above, in this case it was below, so it's actually over here somewhere, right? We wanna know how likely is it that we get this X bar or more extreme if this is true, right? If the mean is truly five. If it's extremely unlikely that we would get that sample or more extreme, then we have evidence for the alternative. If it's not that unlikely that we get our sample if the true mean is five, then we're gonna to fail to reject the null hypothesis. We're gonna say we don't have enough evidence for the alternative. Now, at what level? How unlikely does it have to be for us to make the decision, yeah, I don't think the null hypothesis is true, I think the alternative is true. How unlikely? 0.01, that's what our significance level is. So if our probability, our p-value is 
less than 0.01, then we're going to say, okay, it's really unlikely that we would get this sample if the null hypothesis were true. So I don't think the null hypothesis is true. I think the alternative is true. But if our probability is greater than 0.01, then we're going to say, mm, I don't have enough evidence for the alternative. I think the null hypothesis could still possibly be true. All right, so let's run the test. And we're not going to do this by hand. We're going to do this in our calculator. All right, so this is a one sample T interval. Nope, T test. We're not doing an interval for mu. That tests. Which one do you think it is in the calculator? If it doesn't say prop, it's for a mean. If it doesn't say two sample, it's one sample. Eight is the T interval. That's the one sample T interval. So that's what we were doing last Wednesday, right? That's when we were making a confidence interval. Today we're doing a significance test. Is it T or T test? It's T test. The only time you would use a Z test is if for some reason you knew the population mean, which will 95% of the time not be the case. And that's not the case here. So we're going to use a T test. And we're given statistics, right? So they tell us the mean and the standard deviation. So Mu naught is just your mean from the null hypothesis, so this is 5. X bar, there's our sample mean, so that's 4.81. Sample standard deviation is 0.365. Our sample size is 37. How many degrees of freedom would we be using if we were doing this by hand? 36, just n minus 1. And then our alternative hypothesis is not equal to. So this is what we call the two-tailed test. Let's see, I'll just tell it to draw. There's our t-distribution. They are shading in both tails. It's just super hard to see because look how small our p-value is. So... Write down the t-test statistic, which is negative 3.1664. Write down the p-value. p is 0 0.0031. Okay, and then we'll conclude. And I'll just say since p equals 0 0.0031, which is less than 0 0.01, are we going to reject the null hypothesis or fail? Good. It's really unlikely to get, what we're saying is it's really unlikely we would have gotten this sample if the null hypothesis were true. So unlikely that we think the alternative is to we reject h null in favor of h a we have convincing evidence that and here you would generally add context but this was just given as abstract numbers. We don't know what this data was for. So I'll just say that mu is not equal to 5.
So again, we can just use kind of the state plan do conclude format just to remember all the steps that we need to input, right? So state for a significance test, state your hypotheses, define your variables, uh, and state your significance level that you're going to run the test at. Plan, check your conditions, right? Do, now you're naming your test and, and you're performing your calculations in your calculator. And then conclude, we use the script where you state the p-value. Tell me whether it's larger or smaller than the, uh, the significance level, then we either reject the null hypothesis or we fail to reject. All right. So just a reminder, what the conditions tell us, random condition just tells us that X bar is a good estimate for mu. Large sample condition tells us that we can use a T distribution for a mean, right? And we can use T procedures basically with N minus one degrees of freedom. And then 10% allows us to use the standard error formula. All right. Let's put it all together. So let's see if we can run a full test. And then we're going to remind what's type one versus type two error and describe what it could mean in context. So here we have the dissolve, dissolved oxygen levels in a uh, stream or river is an important indicator of the water's ability to support aquatic life. And a researcher measures the DO at 50 15 randomly chosen locations along the, the stream. Here are the results in milligrams per liter. All right. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is enter this data in my calculator so that I can uh, give myself some space on this screen. And then we'll just walk through the whole thing. So enter that data. Because we, we don't know about the population distribution shape and n is not greater than 30, we got to graph that in a box plot. So see if you can get that box plot going on your own. I'll freeze this, give you a couple of moments while I do it myself. All right, so here's the graph that I get. Pretty symmetric. All right, so let's start off. I'm gonna follow that state plan do conclude model for us here. So state, I'm gonna let mu mu is the true mean DO dissolved oxygen level. of the stream and I'll state my null hypothesis H null is mu equals something Oh, an app. Okay, so the context was an average dissolved oxygen level below five milligrams per liter puts aquatic life at risk. So that means I would want to test that the mean is five, and I'm looking for evidence that the mean is below five, so it's strictly less than five. And they ask us to do this at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level. All right, so I'm gonna go plan and we're gonna go random stated SRS.
I mean, 10% in this case doesn't really make much sense because um, they just sampled 10, 15 different areas in the stream, right? And there's not like a finite number of areas in a stream. So I'm just going to put not applicable here because all the samples would be understood to be independent. Um, and then large counts, we are going to say n equals 15, which is less than 30. And then we're going to sketch our box plot, which was almost perfectly symmetric. And I'll just add an x-axis and say that my samples were of um, DO level. And then we'll create a little scale by just marking at the five number summary what each value was. So if I go back to my graph, my calculator, and I hit trace, all right, so I got 2.87, So just looking at the numbers in the distribution of this sample, the five number summary, I had like, the minimum's way below five, Q1 is four, the median is 4.8, but then Q3 is above five, and the max is well above five. What's your intuition for this? Do you think we're gonna find evidence that the true mean water level is below five, or do you think it'll probably lack evidence? Yeah, because in, even in our sample, we have almost 50% of the measurements were above five. I just intuition wise feel like it, it probably will lack evidence that the true mean is below five, but it's good to, you know, do just a sanity check once in a while. So what you're going to expect, and it may not be the case. I don't know. This is why we're going to run the test. Yeah. My intuition is that our P value will be larger than 0.05, but we'll see. All right. So we're doing a one sample T test for mu. So this is our do step. We'll just go ahead and in our calculator and we'll run the test. So stat tests, this is the second option. But now we're doing it with raw data. So just make sure your input is data. My mu naught, which is my mean from the hypothesis is five. The list I put the data in is list one. Frequency will always keep at one. And then I need to change my alternative from not equal to, to in this case, we're specifically looking for evidence that mu is less than five. So less than mu naught. Right, and I'll have it draw it for me. No, less than five, right? So hold on, let me go back because sometimes that can feel a little confusing. Mu naught is five, right? Oh, okay. And we're looking for evidence that it's less than five, so less than mu naught. And it looked like our intuition was spot on there. So when I graphed it, look how large that shaded region is and our p-value is 0.18 which is much larger than our significance level so write down your test statistic t equals negative 0.946 write down your p-value p equals 0.1809 We'll go ahead and conclude this. I'll just say since P equals 
0 0.1809, which is much greater than 0 0.05. we fail to reject H null in favor of HA. So again, just to give you some context, it's if the null hypothesis is true, if the water really has a DO level of 5%, then there's about an 18% chance that we get the sample that we get we got. That's not that unlikely, right? So we're saying, okay, well then I think that the null hypothesis could be true. So we don't have evidence of the alternative. So now let's add context. We failed to reject H null in favor of HA. We do not have convincing evidence that the DO level of the stream is less than five milligrams per liter. Okay, so that's a full walkthrough of a significance test for a mean. Start to finish with a full credit analysis. Um, just a couple more things we want to mention. All right, two-sided tests and confidence intervals uh, are basically inverse, inversions of each other. You guys have already been doing this um, sort of analyses where you ask, you're, you've been asked if the confidence interval supports the conclusion of the test. So a 95% confidence interval will correspond to a 5% two-tailed significance test. So if a 95% confidence interval for mu does not capture the null value, then you can reject H null at the two -sided, in a two-sided test at the 5% significance level. And if a 95% does capture the null value, that means that the null value is a plausible value of the mean, and you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right. Um, I don't want to do this full problem. I want to get to, because I do have an AP problem that I pulled that I would like to do as an example. Maybe I'd rather do this problem now that I look at that one. We're going to do this one, but I'm going to forego checking conditions, okay? Let's skip part B. I'll say assume the conditions are true. Do you all feel reasonably confident in checking conditions after we've been doing it for months? Okay, so assume these. At the Hawaii Pineapple Company, the mean value of the pineapples harvested from one large field was 31 ounces last year. A different irrigation system was installed in this field after the growing season. Managers wonder if this change will affect the mean weight of future pineapples grown in the field. To find out, they select and weigh a random sample of 50 pineapples from this year's crop. A, state an appropriate pair of hypotheses for this significance test. Be sure to divide the parameter of interest. I do want to do that. So A, mu is the 
mean weight of the new crop, right? All right, help me out with my hypotheses. Um, what would my null hypothesis be? I'm trying to find out if... Yeah, that's exactly right. Because what we're trying to find out is if this change will affect the mean weight of future pineapples grown. So we're going to use last year's mean weight, which was 31 ounces, right? So mu equals 31 ounces, a.k.a. We're assuming there's no change, right? Using this new irrigation system. What's my alternative then? There is a change, which just saying a change isn't indicative of one direction or the other. So we're just going to say not equal to, and this is going to be a two-tailed test. Okay. All right, so they say a 95% confidence interval for the mean weight of all pineapples grown in the field this year is 31.255 to 32.16 or 616. Based on the interval, what conclusion would you make for the a test of the hypotheses in part A at the 5% significance level? We're skipping B. They already created the confidence interval. We're going straight to C. This is a two-tailed test and the 95% confidence interval. Is the null hypothesis, is the null mean in that interval? No, meaning all of those are greater than our null hypothesis. So we, would we reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level or fail to reject? We would reject, good. So reject H null in favor of HA. Can we conclude that the different irrigation system caused a change in the mean weight of pineapples produced? Explain your answer. Um, yeah, I think it's reasonable to conclude, right? Like this is a relatively controlled experiment, although you can't control all the variables. Like could have been a different climber climate that that season or a different rainy season that season as well so there could have been other things that influenced this but they did a reasonable experiment so i would say reasonably yes i'm gonna say reasonably controlled experiment so yes Oh, they say no. It was not a randomized comparative experiment. Oh, okay. Well, they said exactly what I did, but I think this is... Mm, I would give full credit for this one as long as you supported it with other things. What they really should have done, I guess, is created a whole nother field in the same season and irrigated it using the new system so that everything was being held the same, including weather. But yeah, it, the reason they're technically saying no is because of those other variables that I mentioned. But practically in real life, you could also account for those things. Like you, you could know how much more rain was happened this year, how much of an effect that had on your crop. Um, all right. And what they're, one thing about that though, is the difference between significant, oh good, statistical significance and practical significance. Like looking at this, we did find that there was a significant difference in the mean weight of pineapples from this year to last year. 
But is there any real practical significance? Mm. Like these are at most heavier by like 0.3 ounces on average. 0.3 ounces is not, you're not gonna be able to tell the difference between those two things, like holding one in one hand and, and one in the other. So this is statistically significant, but probably not practically significant. There was another example, I think we do it in QR, where they're testing like a diet pill and they did an experiment, a controlled experiment where one group took a placebo and the other took this diet pill and they kept their diets the same over six months. And they found a statistically significant result that on average, the, the diet pill group lost um, an average of like 1.2 pounds more than the um, placebo group over the course of six months. Well, that could be statistically significant. Is there any practical significance on losing a pound over a six month period? Like your body weight fluctuates by more than a pound from morning to night in any given day. So probably not practically significant, even though it's statistically significant. So it's under, important to understand the difference between those. Um, and I think we're gonna forego that uh, AP example. Maybe I'll do that as a warm up tomorrow. All right, couple things. 